I am in Taiwan sitting today with James Willen from Sydney. What's up, James? Uh, mate, it's uh, it's been a big morning with the Fed announcement, so uh, it was an early start. Um, it's uh, it's been a very very weird sideways sort of uh, day here, so we're just trying to figure out what uh, what strategies we're going to be using into the afternoon. Um, nothing really detailed on that, and we're happy to let this market just go sideways. So it's uh, some days some days the best thing to do is nothing. It's also the hardest thing to do. Yeah, true. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Yeah. So James is a investment manager at VS VFS Group. Yep. And he's going to be here to talk about kind of the side of it, it, all investment management, all what what's that about, and give some techniques on how you can also improve as a trader. So what I want to start with James is kind of introduce yourself, tell people what you're doing these days, and what like how you grew to that to to what you're doing today. Uh, okay. So I um I've been in the financial services industry since about 2005 uh came up as a as a junior junior stockbroker and picked up the ropes spent a bit of time at ubs uh learning how and why back offices connect and how they and how they work um uh, got gfc'd as we all got gfc'd at the time managed to survive that by um building a couple of businesses on the way through and from there jump jump uh, uh managed to come to a little a uh, wealth manager by the name of VFS, started by some very close friends of mine, some uh, some uh, very good, honest, uh, hardworking guys who started about seven years ago. And uh, they've given me a little corner of the world to uh, to run a managed discretionary account, a series of managed discretionary accounts, which we you know, we loosely call a fund. Um, and so we give private client advice to retail and some um, wholesale clients. And uh, I trade a, what's called a global macro fund. So that's uh, trading um, all hours of the day uh, to most developed countries in the world, uh, mostly US, uh, a little bit of uh, England before Brexit, um, uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of Europe, and, and enough Australia uh, when it's interesting enough. Uh, mostly equities, uh, options to protect, maybe make a bit of money on the side, uh, a little bit of futures, and uh, FX for hedging. So we've uh, we've had the G, uh, we've had the global macro fund for uh, technically now it's been going since about March April last year so now about a year and uh, it's gone quite well we've uh, we've changed systems a lot of the time uh, you know a lot of teething issues in, in getting a thing started a lot of assistance needed to start a managed discretionary account it's it's, it's very difficult to actually run one um, our regulator is. Uh, they're, they're always making sure that you do it right because trading on a discretionary basis for clients is a, uh, a heck of a privilege and one that the uh, the regulator wants to make sure that you're doing right. So you've got to make sure that your uh, your, uh, your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. Right, right. And that's probably very different from someone trading retail, I guess. So what I'm curious to know is how did you kind of start to get involved in trading in the first place? What, why, like what was that first moment? Uh, the, the first moment, I actually didn't come up with it myself. I was uh, very much in love with a young uh, a young woman who would go on to be my wife and she didn't really like the idea of a uh, of a husband who was working behind a bar even though I was quite good at it you know I could pour a great beer and I love talking to people um, I love helping people out and uh, so her father who's been in the human resource management game for uh, for about he'd been in about in that game for about 40 years ran me through a few tests and did a few things and Came up with a list of jobs that I might uh, I might be interested in, and uh, stockbroking was on that list. I went straight for it. It was funny because I'd actually already been running our family's you know small investment portfolio for the last couple of years, and I hadn't even realised that that I'd actually been doing okay at it, and that I actually enjoyed it. So it uh, it took that moment of uh, of my fiance uh, threatening to leave me if I was going to stay cleaning glasses behind a bar. And uh, and to, to realise that I had actually been uh, an informal stockbroker for uh, for a couple of years already, and uh, from there just uh, absorb, 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 be a sponge. Um, they call it the uh, what do they call it the the, uh, the golden ratio or whatever it's uh, the, the the beautiful ratio. You got two ears and one mouth for a reason. That uh, that's someone's way of telling you that you should do more listening than uh, than talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And we have a bunch of people who just join us. We have uh, let's see, hey, Kilo and Mal. Wonderful. A uh, few people from Belgium, UK. That's wonderful. Wow. You are in Sydney, which is also awesome. So we have people from pretty much everywhere right now. That's great. Okay. 
So what I'm curious to know is, because there's a big difference, I think, I think, between learning a lot of stuff. So you can go to university, learn about different things, but you also have to apply, I guess. So how did you kind of practice what you learned? Did you have to practice a lot? And how did you're, you still, it, you're always practicing, always practicing, always developing, and always getting better. The worst brokers are the ones who think they know everything and refuse to admit that, they're, that they have any gaps. And the funny thing is that the old guys who, who go through, some of the best brokers, first off, some of the best brokers I've ever met didn't finish year 10 or did, definitely didn't finish uh, what, what you'd call, what do you, what do you, what do you call it in, uh, in Montreal, sixth form or, or year 12, I think you do, do you work on that yeah, sort of thing. It's like high school, right? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. They didn't, go, they didn't go all the way through. They just know how stuff works. They've, they've worked in an actual industry. Um, some of the worst brokers I've ever known have, uh, have got masters in um, economics and, and MBAs. They think that they know how, to, uh, how things work, but they actually don't know how companies work. Um, but one of, the, one of the key areas is to always just be aware of where your weaknesses are. And I've always been aware of where my weaknesses are because they are, uh, they are many. One of the quotes that keeps me going, and we used to have it up in my first job in broking, in the Melbourne office, they had it on, uh, on the whiteboard. The wisest of men still have much to learn. I think it's a Confucian uh, expression, but that uh, that was the motto of the guys down in Melbourne. Um, you know, there there is there is such a thing as stupid questions, so always sort of think about it before you spit it out. But uh, but never be afraid to put your hand up and ask a question, especially if something doesn't make sense to you, and especially if you're talking to a company. If you're talking to a company and something doesn't add up, ask, ask, and then ask again until you get the answer that you want. And if they can't answer that question, then just walk out. And that saved us a lot of money over the past. Mm, love it, love it. And we'll get to you guys' question. If if ever you have a question, come on below in the chat. Just uh, go and just fire them off. Sorry, what? Just just ask away, man. Oh yeah, cool, perfect. And uh, my answer is asking: Is this is Melbourne or Sydney? This is Sydney, where James is. James is right now. Yep, live from uh, live from Sydney. A building called Australia Square it was built in 1968. Um, was the first. Uh, the first uh, skyscraper, I suppose, in Sydney. Perfect. I'm guessing what, what, so what, what would you recommend people who want to get into either Forex or stock trading or whatever, and they want to learn to become profitable? What do you think they would have to do? Uh, the, the, trick, the trick to being profitable and every single book and every person who is a half decent trader and even the bad ones will say that first and foremost, capital preservation has to be the priority. If you're good at preserving capital, then you will be at least on the first step of being a half decent trader. Whether you're profitable is a whole different thing, but you're definitely going to be one way of not blowing yourself up in that black swan event. And even not even a black swan event, even a known known, people still blow themselves up and go into it half cocked, don't have their risk management set, don't use proper options protection, don't use proper FX hedging, don't use stops that actually work, um, and, and, and a multitude of things. Capital preservation is on page one, line one, of anything that you want to do. And anytime you're talking to clients, it's always, always the best thing to go with and always the best way to start. No client will ever, ever harass you if you say, I had your capital at heart, first and foremost. So to become a profitable trader, I suppose you start with that and then read a bunch of books. Um, I was given in my first job uh, a couple of books. One was by Ben Graham and the other one was by Peter Lynch, which was written in the 80s and just as valid today. How to uh, what is it? How to how to make money in the stock market or something really simple that was there, Peter Lynch, and and you go through that. I really should probably read it again because it's been about ten years since I flipped through it, and I think that probably the lessons that that you've learned in ten years of being in the industry, you can start to relate it a bit better. But it's the yeah. basics on how to value on how to value a company. It's the basics on on, on how to actually ask the right questions of a company, uh, and it's and it's also just sort of a decent good read. So that's how I that's how I started up everything from there. I do apologise for my voice. I was doing some. I was doing some sales last night. My job isn't always trading. It's actually more of a. Uh, it's it's about half a sales job, half a trading job. Investing at, at the same time. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was selling. I was doing some selling last night. So this, this is also a good question, but I, I think it's something powerful that you get when you read a book. Like in the beginning, then you read it back a few years after. Yeah. You get some lessons, and you can relate much more to the things that are in the book sometimes. That's right, and you pick up the pick up the things that you've that you've. That your failings always because you've got to be aware always be aware of of, uh, of where you're failing and where you can improve and sort of go back over those books if anything i could say i don't get a chance to read enough books um because most of my time is buried in in either research or in um in uh in a lunch <laughs> but, uh, 
so, you know, I find that I'm bogged down so much on reading company reports and reading macro uh, thematics and people's views that uh, that I don't get enough chance to read. And, and I suppose if I was going to highlight one weakness of mine is that I don't get enough chance to read stuff that isn't about companies and isn't about macro. You've got to switch off sometimes. And even if it's just to read about trading strategies, that's close enough for me. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And so since you talk about capital preservation, and I guess... Are the rules the same where when you trade it for yourself as a retail trader and in a big company, in a big institution, or is it pretty much the same? I guess it can be more strict for a big company. It depends what's going on. I mean, a lot of the time with the trading side, so take an institutional uh, trader. Uh -huh. um, so they're trying to deal, their, their key priority in this industry is to get the buy side on one end of the trade, talking to the sell side on the other end of the trade and crossing that up. They don't, really, they don't really care about capital preservation. They're just trying to find an edge on why one guy wants to be buying that stock and why another guy wants to be selling that stock. And that's all they're really trying to do. When it comes to retail, though, um, that is absolutely has to be our first and foremost on that. The institutional side, everyone wants to get into the institutional side, but the way that the industry is moving now, it's so difficult. Institutions are looking for reasons to switch brokers off, not, not start relationships with brokers. They've got their own in-house guys. Mifid two regulations have come in and met the brokers now are uh, trying to they have to they have to put a value sorry the buy side guys have to put a, a value on the research that the sell side guys are uh, are putting to them. And a lot of the buy side guys are saying, look, it, it, uh, Goldman Sachs, we're not paying thirty thousand dollars for that research report, for example. Um, so you can basically stick it and we're gonna have and you know these big these big institutions have got their own research houses. Um, and they've got their own algo trading. They've got their own boxes. They've got their own algorithms that they that they run uh, in the background. They've got their own ways of doing things. They don't need a guy on the phone. The guys that are on the phones are dinosaurs, and we can see that when we were at UBS, the guys that were on the phones were becoming a very selective, rare breed that was there. I can't even remember what your question was now, mate. I've just been rattling. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so the question was, I think, how do you preserve capital? And this is oh. very as a retail trader or oh yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So with the retail. With the retail side of things, it's we use options on most of the things that we do. So we have a very simple, and if I if I could talk about one of the strategies that we actually use in the equity space is to buy a, a high yielding stock that we actually believe has room to grow and room and, and room on the upside. Buy the stock, buy a put slightly underneath it. So automatically, you, you, you're protected to that strike underneath that. Hopefully, touching wood, the stock rallies, will then roll that put up and sell the call about at the money or a little bit higher. Net, 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 the options should take care of themselves and wipe each other out. Um, but you're then protected and you're in a risk-free trade and the rest is um, the capital that you're going to get if you get exercised away or, and definitely, you, you, you're in it for the, dividends and uh, and because we're in Australia we have this beautiful thing called franking credits that adds um, adds an extra few percent onto uh, onto the dividend amount that you get in your bank uh, at the end of the day so that's that's a really simple strategy but it means that up to 50 percent of our portfolios are protected with options just mm -hmm. just automatically so no matter what mums and dads super fund retirees they absolutely love it you know why because there could be a GFC now while I'm sitting here and they know exactly how much they stand to lose. And it's definitely not as much as everyone else. And that's a really good conversation to have when, when, a, when a Donald Trump happens, let's say that the market had continued to fall after he, after he was elected, or Brexit, you know, the market had continued to fall after Brexit. Imagine the conversations that you'd be having with people if there were no options protecting those downside positions. Yeah. Yeah. Like GFC, but people, I've got clients now who are still trying to get their money back after losing it from the GFC. Mm -hmm. it's pretty anyway, yeah. sorry, that's that's the way that we do it. Uh, first and foremost, I'd say anyone that you talk to, any equities position, you've got to have a look and see if you can protect it with options. Otherwise, right. you're leaving yourself open to a black swan. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And one thing people are wondering about, so we have Archer here who's asking about what's your trading style? What kind of style are you? Do you day trade? Do you swing trade? And one person uh, also is like, how do you manage this with your, your, the other aspect of your jobs, like selling and all these things? Uh, yeah, it, 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 you do spread yourself a little bit thin. It means that talking to clients today, uh, my voice is a little bit rusty, but I suppose that they, you know, I think that my clients want to have someone who's actually out and about talking to people. 
um, because in this industry, a lot of it, it's not about what you know. Sometimes it's about who you know. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm not, you don't deal in, uh, don't deal in inside information, but it's always good to know someone's take on a, take on a stock. And the only way that you're going to know that is, is by getting out and talking to people. So, uh, what was your question? Sorry about. Um, so, what is your trading style in terms of? Uh, trading style. Look, and, we, yeah. we take okay. So we take uh, large, sizable positions in either single stock uh, globally based on macro sentiment. So we see a macro. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, about when was it? Before Trump was elected. So regardless of who was going to be elected, we took a very big, sizable position in Bank of America and a very big, sizable position. In Goldman Sachs, and the the basic reason for that was just that the banks, the U.S. banks, after the GFC had slimmed down so much, slimmed right down, they they got rid of all the fat, all the middle management, all the layers of of crap, all the regulations that had come in. The banks were overregulated, which was fantastic to have a bank that's overregulated. And then you've got a steepening of the yield curve as it as as more and more expectations of Fed increases were coming in in 2016, and so we took some really big chunky positions. That was just a big sentiment macro driven position that we did and that ended up i mean gee where was uh, bank of america back in 2000 mid mid 2016 um i think that was gee that was close to probably about an 80 percent. i think uh, you know i can't look i don't have a chart in front of me but it was it was substantial and it was things like that it was it was taking a, a position on the italian banks for the same reason uh, a while ago when uh, when the european the you know when the european revolution was coming in Take a position on some French companies as well when Macron was elected. Um, it's 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 those sort of big sentiment driven uh, things that we do right now. The thing that I'm looking for is when to get short this market. And there's an expression that we've got: 99% of the time, be long. It's just easier. Markets go up, especially over the last 10 years. Just be long. Don't try and be the guy that keeps on trying to pick tops. You're just going to look like a fool. Wait and wait and wait. And what we're doing now is waiting and waiting and waiting because I don't think we can really stretch much more out of this market. So that's what we're looking for. So the big sentiment shift that we're looking for now is going to be when it's time to start shorting this market. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of thing that we do. We don't care. We can have our feet up and, and wait months for this to happen. Um, day trading, super funds, the way that the Australian market really goes, super funds don't really like the day trading side of things unless they're actually set up for it. It's, it's not really advisable uh, to do so. Also, it's not really in the theme of, of us running a, a global macro fund as we do. Sometimes we'll take a, a position in a, take for example, Twitter. Uh, that was one that we, you know, we, we, we held that for, probably that's the shortest holding that we've had. Uh, and we went into that and I was loud and proud on that on Twitter. So I was, I was, I was on Twitter saying I was buying Twitter um, a couple of weeks ago just on that takeover speculation and also on their on going into their results um for the first time in its entire history twitter is actually turning a profit so we, we held that and we only held that for about two or three days um made it a nice quick easy 20 percent that was that's about it the, the the shortest time frame that we'd hold something that that um and that was only because it did so well had it done badly we would have uh, we would have cut it early as well so that is very fundamentally driven basically driven on the news and the, the companies it's 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 trying to see where the next money movement is going if you if i can understand if you can understand that it's where the etfs are going to be buying it's where vanguard's going to be buying it's where blackrock is going to be buying it's where the big funds are thinking of going next and we don't have to be right in front of that because you're going to get it wrong we'd rather just be a part of that and and catch it there's a reason why stocks go up there's a reason why stocks go down sometimes don't don't try and question it just be a part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the questions we had in the chat here, and I'm, I'm not sure how far you can go in this, but yep. one of the questions we had is uh, people who want to know how they can align themselves with what the big institution are doing to kind of get on the right track. Are there some ways uh, to think that? Or? Yeah, a little bit of pieces um, when it comes to the institution. Um, instos are required if, if they've got a, a substantial shareholding. In a company, they're required to say if they're increasing or decreasing. That's often a bit of a, a red herring and, and, and can be a bit of a false uh, a false flag. Um, but we find that just talking to them is, is the best way of going. And I, I know that it's going to be difficult for people who aren't in the industry or in the city where they need to be. To be. But a lot of it is just finding the Insta guys who know what's going on, 
and finding the finding the institutions and knowing the guys and, and taking the position. A lot of it's just the network. And I, I, I hate to say it, I'm not a very smart guy and I'm not a super successful fund manager, if you could call me that. I'm not a super successful portfolio manager. We do okay, but a big part of the reason why we've done as well as we have is just because we've got a network and just because we, we know where the money is going. It's not trying to second guess what the company is doing. It's not trying to, not trying to do any in-depth analysis of the company. It's knowing enough about the company to get by, but a lot of it is just knowing where the, where, where the money is moving which is just about the network, it's just about the conversation and it's just about continuing to talk and talk and talk until you're blue, and listening and listening and listening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good point. I think even people at home would be able to do that if they were to kind of get in find friends who are in big companies or friends who trade like in, in big institutions that they could work as well. So it's been true. Yeah, I mean, a lot. Uh, the, the, the chat rooms, I just don't know about, I just don't know about the chat rooms at all. Um, and, and the sort of chat that goes on around the, in those places. I try and stay away from them. Yeah. I found that Twitter, Twitter, I think now is probably the best place for financial information um, in whatever it is that you want to do. Um, another reason why I, lo I like the stock and I, um, is, is just because people are moving off the chat rooms, the, the pump and dump chat rooms, and they've started to move towards actually actual financial commentary on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what, there's only so much that you're going to learn watching Bloomberg and it's good, which is fantastic, but they're telling you what happened yesterday. Yeah. You get, and you, you got to get the, the, Bloomberg, the Bloomberg analysts that are on there will actually be on Twitter telling you what they think is going to happen tomorrow. A lot of the time they don't, they, they, they're not saying that on TV, but that's where I get a lot of my information from. Um, you know, get a good tweet deck, streamline it for the sort of stocks that you're looking at, streamline it for the sort of trades that you're looking for, streamline the people that you want to have and, 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 and pull the exact the exact data that you want on uh, on whatever it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was screening kind of the bad information off Twitter. It's like there's, a, I guess, a lot of good and some bad that you have to kind of screen out a little bit sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind the bad information. It sometimes makes me laugh. Um, uh -huh. uh, the fake, I, I don't mind digging into a bit of fake news every now and then either. But uh, no, it's um, looking, the mute button is always there on Twitter. Um, take everything with a grain of salt and always always um look at the self-interest of the people who are uh who are um who are spruiking it i won't say now i won't i won't give any uh, i won't give any names away but it was a very very significant fund manager and i won't i won't give any more details than that he took a photo of his uh the front page of a newspaper and he was he was highlighting something that was on the front page of the newspaper and i zoomed in on the photo because if you put it on twitter and he's, I zoomed in on the photo and I saw a, a post-it note in the very top right corner of his desk that was in the very top right corner of the, of the photo. And it said, potential shorts, underlined with four or five stock codes on it um, and the prices at which he was happy to start shorting it or the prices at which he was short. Um, uh, or the, yeah, and, and I looked at that and you were thinking, this guy moves a lot of money. He's either just given this information by accident or he's very, very, very subtly trying to push the market in a direction that he wants to go. Either way, we used, we used the hell out of that information that we have to come across. Um, and uh, it, uh, I think the, the photo was taken down, um, but uh, it turned out that every single thing that he had as a, a potential short turned out to be the best shorts in the market. So wow. that was uh, that was something. I won't give you any more details because I'll probably get the guy sacked, and I actually quite like him. So, um, mm -hmm. but there, there, there's little bits and pieces like that. It's paying attention to details like that. Yeah, but yeah. The, the, the Twitter information is fantastic. And again, that's going to be doing your own research because you cannot like execute on everything you see and hear about because that would be no. Like, oh my god, you go broke. It, this is, <laughs> there's a reason why we don't buy on Fridays because usually. You know, you have you have a bit of a lunch, uh, you know, with uh, with a couple of guys in the industry. Everyone sort of swaps swaps notes, gets on the comparison, and then eventually everyone starts talking up their book. You come back to the come back to the office on Friday afternoon, and you think, yeah, that was great. I think that that particular you know bottom dwelling penny stock is an absolute go at this price. I'm going to charge in. We don't do any buying on Fridays at all for that rule. It's uh, it's never a good idea. You're exhausted. You've had a long lunch. You've been you know you've been sweet talked by. Um, you've been sweet talked by uh, by some guy in the pub, and absolutely not a good idea to start going in and buying stocks on a Friday, no. especially with and even more so the, the expression we don't buy on Friday coming in.
when Trump got elected and Trump, uh, the, when Trump became president, we stopped buying on Fridays because that's basically having Friday night and a Saturday and then the Sunday, three days effectively of risk um, where you can't do anything on the trades that you've got open if you've done it on Friday. So we, I know that it's sort of, okay, so just do it on Thursday. If we've got to do something on Friday, we'll leave it until Monday because it's absolutely not worth doing it and, and, and exposing yourself to the three days of risk immediately. Nothing looks worse than buying a stock and it hitting the floor within 24 hours of you buying it. It's just terrible. Right, right, right. And I, I can relate to this as well. Like, it's very rare that I'll put it on Friday. Like, I prefer to wait on Monday anyway because you have, you know, I have like, a, like a gap on the weekend or whatever, but it's still yeah. going to be pretty much the same price for Friday. It's not yeah. worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah. To leave Friday for the clients, leave Friday for the chat, leave Friday for the, you know, swapping a few rumors that you've heard around the market. <laughs> um, build, up, build on your network, do some analysis. Buy the buy the buy the team some beers and uh, and uh, you know and just settle in, but don't be hitting the button on Friday. <laughs> it's always it's a, it's it's a bit of a mugs game. That's good advice. And so yeah. one question also is how do you kind of keep the optimal mindset with all that going on, like the the, the rumors, the news, the events, and all, all that stuff. Uh, it just becomes part of it. You don't even know what's going on. Eventually, it, you don't even know that it's part of it. But uh, a lot of the time, we'll map something out on a. Uh, on, a, on a big piece of butcher's paper or a whiteboard. If I could turn the camera around, I won't because there's some pretty confidential stuff on the walls here. But we cover the glass in things. When we've got an idea about a stock that's going on, we'll, you know, put a circle here and then move it over there and then sort of see. And eventually we'll just sort of develop this big picture that we've got on an idea or a notion or a strategy. Take, for example, um, Europe. Uh, we, were, we were one of the first people to start talking about how PMIs in Europe, everything was green. Um, they're showing really good grass, you know, green shoots in Europe. Um, when was that? 12, 18 months ago. It was about 12 months ago. Europe is coming back. We're buying stuff, but we're going into, okay, so what happens? Europe, great. You can't just buy Europe unless you want to buy an ETF. That's that's okay, and you'll, and, and you'll perform okay, and we do do that. But if you go, okay, so what's our idea? It's, it's going to be Europe. Okay. What do people do when they get a bit more, you know, okay, so the labour market starts to, to, to tighten up a bit. There was still a bit of slack. So what happens when the labour market starts to tighten up? Then you get wage growth. Then you get inflation. If you get wage growth, then okay, so people are going to start to to buy uh, buy some products. And so then all of a sudden, it, that, that was sort of that the, the the building blocks of a theme that we had. And okay, so what are they going to buy? You know, it's the champagne and hamburg uh, and handbags and stuff like that. We looked at Louis Vuitton. So we bought um, uh, Louis Vuitton uh, LVMH. The stock code is MC now. Uh, you know, things like Heineken. Things like and, and, and we just and we just pick these things of just like what do Europeans with a little bit more confidence in their own market start to do? And it's and it's buying champagne and handbags and, 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 and nice beers and more of it. Also the Asian, you know, the Chinese thing, you know, helps too. I mean, that probably could have had more to do with the trade thing than anything else. We didn't really have to worry about what was happening in Europe, but it all worked out pretty good in the end. Mm -hmm. Love it. And I guess your personal mindset as well is gonna impact like what you do and what you what you research. So do you have any tips on how People as traders can just preserve a good mindset whenever they want to come into the market. Uh, yeah, I, I don't trade angry. Um, don't trade angry. Try not to be angry um, if you can. What I one of my biggest failings that I have is that when I sell a stock, I don't revisit it, or I sort of forget to do so, and it just it just goes from my screen. And so this is something that I'm working on on, on myself. I've got okay, great. We bought it. We sold it. Hopefully for a profit. And and then I don't look at it again, and I and I really should because I've noticed I've noticed over ten years probably the first thing that I was told when I started in my first job is, do you think that it's easier to know everything about everything, or would you rather know everything about a very very small amount of things? And the answer absolutely, if you're going to look retrospectively, is is it is so much easier to know a really really small detailed thing and just trade on that. And so, if anything, I, I should probably laser beam my focus a little bit better on uh, on on a few small things instead of just trying to do trying to do everything and trying to be everything to everyone. But uh, absolutely, I don't revisit stocks enough. So the mentality, the mentality too, if if, if it goes bad, because we do it, we, it happens a lot. We go into the wrong stock at the wrong time or the right stock at the wrong time, and we get rid of it and we don't look at it again. And that's something that we should, and, and it's absolutely something that I should do better. Um, but I'm aware of that. I'm working on it. So, um, but but that's that sort of thing. That mentality of just continually talking and discussing and discussing themes. 
I went through this stage uh, a couple of months ago of realizing that I didn't have anyone to, 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 to bounce some ideas off. And so I realized that some of the decisions that I was making was just me sitting inside an echo chamber, um, you know, just sort of pitching myself the ideas. And what's funny is that every idea I have is fantastic. So <laughs> I had a bit of a discussion with, uh, with some, of the, some of the guys. It was just like, okay, look, I need a sounding board for my ideas. And they need a sounding board for their ideas too. So it's, it's more just like just discussing it, being questioned on it, justify it, and, uh, and coming up with the, with the theme. The mentality that if you find yourself sitting in, a, in an echo chamber and everything that you say sounds fantastic, you should probably go and find some, uh, find some people to talk to about your ideas that you've got. I find that, and that's the best way of working it through, just going through that conversation and going through that, going through the process and going through the motions, allowing yourself to be questioned on things too, allowing yourself to be challenged. The biggest, uh, the, sorry, the best, I was going to say the best performing or the best, the biggest hedge fund, um, which is run by uh, Bridge, Bridgewater, which is run by Dalio, Ray Dalio. He had lunch with the FT uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was a fantastic article that was there. And the way that Bridgewater runs is that they will challenge and challenge and challenge, and it is encouraged to, to really question, almost to the point of, of harassment. Um, it's a hedge fund, so they can get away with a certain number of, uh, you know, the uh, people don't care about that sort of thing when you're working in a hedge fund and you're getting paid seven figures. So the, the well, eight figures if you're lucky. Um, but, so you can, and, and they challenge and they question all the time on everything that they do. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna come out there with an idea, you better have, you better be able to back it up on that sort of thing. And that's what we do here too. So. We, you know, probably not to the extent that Bridgewater's doing it. Um, you know, one day I'd, uh, I wouldn't mind being Ray Dalio, but uh, it's it's more just about making sure that you got other people to talk to and other people to, 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 to pick you up when you're actually doing the wrong thing. That I don't know, just being open to that sort of stuff. I'm yeah, rambling yeah. though. I'm hungry. Uh, I mean, that's a good <laughs> advice for pretty much anyone in any profession, any job, even as a, as a retail owner, you got to have the research and the plan behind what it, like everything you do, which is interesting. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> so I want to respect your time, but how can people find, uh, how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after this uh, video? Uh, I can be contacted on, what do we say? Yeah, we've got an email address. It's GMF, so uh, Golf Mike Foxtrot. Actually, there's a piece of advice for you. Learn the phonetic alphabet. There you go. That's, a, that's, a, that's the first thing. <laughs> if you don't know the phonetic alphabet, you can't sit on any trading room in the world. So it's Golf Mike Foxtrot at VFS group, so that's uh, Victor Foxtrot Sierra group.com.au. That's an email address there. We've got a website as well. If you look up VFS group, um, uh, it'll come up. It's got a beautiful picture of the Sydney Harbour that's there. Have a look through that and you'll be able to find my details on there. I write a, I write a bit of a blog. I've been a bit slack on it lately because I've been doing a lot of selling um, and, uh, and we've been doing a, some really big portfolio switches on, into a momentum driven quant strategy at the moment, which is very exciting. And I can tell you more about that later. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I write uh, I write sort of a bit of a funny a funny piece every week or two, and uh, it uh, it gets quite a bit of traction sometimes. It's there, so um, yeah. If uh, if you if you send me a note, I'll uh, I'll put you on the list for that one. Mostly, it's just stuff that I pick up around the internet, and and, and it's that connection that I sort of draw. This is like what did I write about um, debt the other day about the number of companies that were that were actually using their tax break. From the tax uh, from the tax break that they've just got in the US, the number of companies who are actually going to use that to pay down debt at an actual quantitative figure, it was only like six or eight percent out of four hundred companies that, that that had reported after that tax break was um, was going to be handed back to them. They're only going to use eight percent of their money, free money, to pay down debt. We've got one interest rate rise this morning. There's another two to come. There's a steepening yield curve out there. And companies aren't using this to pay down debt. So this is the start of that idea that I had of, of, of zombie companies, zombie companies with too much debt are going to be the best shorts in the market. Anyway, but that's me rambling on that sort of thing. But that's the sort of stuff that I, that, that, that I go through in, uh, in my little blog. Love it. And that article is going to be linked below in the description of this video for sure. I think it's already linked below. So I guess it's oh, that'd be handy. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, got a, we, got a, we got a poster as well. We spent okay. a lot of money on this. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's getting our money's worth here. Awesome. I have one question I ask all my guests on the, in, in this channel, on the, these uh, podcasts. If you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence of advice be? Uh, you're only as good as your last trade. <laughs> so I suppose 
Um, you know, you see a lot of cocky people talking about something that they did five years ago. Nobody cares. You're only as good as the last as the last thing you did. Um, stay sharp, stay focused. That would be it. Um, I once got a job in 2005 at a, a little stockbroker by the name of Ostock, and I, I told the head of the desk in the second interview, uh, "You've got to separate the wheat from the chaff." I didn't know what that meant then. I don't know what that means now, but I got the job, so that seemed to work. He liked that sort of attitude. I got my job at UBS, uh, talking to the head of desk there, uh, and he asked me the same thing, what, what it gets through, and I, and I used the expression, I know boats. I don't know what I know boats meant then, and I don't know what it means now, but I got the job, so that seemed to work for me as well. Um, but, yeah, so, look, if you could separate the wheat from the chaff and, uh, and get a good knowledge of boats, then uh, I suppose then, then you're going to get on your way. But uh, don't forget the... Uh, the uh, the wisest of men still have much to learn. That absolutely has to be number one, though, so if, if we're talking seriously. Never stop learning, never stop reading, never stop absorbing. Love it, love it. Perfect, James. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. No worries. Thanks a lot, everyone. Awesome.